Hello, my name is Eric. I'm a postdoc at the University of Edinburgh, and thanks for checking out my video today on the development of detailed physics-based models of wild and fire behavior. And I, of course, would like to thank the International Association of Fire Safety Science for acknowledging the work of my thesis and giving me this opportunity to share some of that work. But I also have to thank a great number of people who helped get me to this point. Of course, my supervisors, Albert Simeone and Rory Haddon, um, but there were also a great number of other people, both here and across the world, really, who uh, gave me a lot of support over the years. The goal of my thesis was really to investigate the current state of development of these physics-based models of wildland fire behavior, to test the modeling approach against some experimental data, and then to try to offer some insights as to where we as a community might need to focus future development efforts if we really want to push forward these models uh, into the next generation. And of course, I'd like to share some of the insights gained in this investigation, but I'd also like to uh, talk a little bit about some of the current work which has followed on from those insights. And before really diving into all of that, I think it is worthwhile to try to put this modeling approach in context of all of the various tools which we might have available to uh, investigate or simulate aspects of wildland and fire behavior. If we consider a spectrum of modeling tools, on one end, we have the fully empirical approach, where we really take a series of observations we have about a particular aspect of fire behavior, for example, rate of spread, and uh, these might come from laboratory experiments or from field observations, and we try to develop a functional relationship that lets us predict that uh, characteristic given uh, a series of conditions or input parameters. So one example we can consider is this uh, kind of bootleg replica I have of the CSIRO grassland fire spread meter. And uh, this is a nice, very functional, simple, uh, fully empirical model where we have these little paper dials that we can spin around to select uh, different conditions that we might have uh, on a given day in terms of the temperature, humidity, wind speed, and so on. And by lining up the arrows, that allows us to come up with a simple prediction of the rate of spread in uh, these grassland fuels. You can imagine how useful a tool like this could be. It's very easy to get a quick and simple to understand prediction of fire behavior, but the relationships uh, that go into this were really tuned to the observations of fire spread in grasslands. So we can't really use it for other fuel types or for conditions that are obviously outside those which are printed on the dials here. So that is a limit to the empirical approaches. There's not a lot of flexibility necessarily. One thing we could do to maybe increase the, the flexibility or the usefulness of a fully empirical approach is to take something like this and apply a mathematical method like the level set method in order to extend our prediction into two spatial dimensions and uh, as a function of time so that we're able to actually predict where a fire might spread as opposed to simply how quickly it would spread. Perhaps we now want to include some simple physics in our prediction of the fire spread, something like the relationship between the amount of energy released from some burning vegetation and how much of that energy is transferred ahead to an unburnt fuel package. But we might still need to make some observations of fire spread in experiments or in the field in order to close that model or parameterize the model. And so we have this kind of hybrid uh, semi-empirical or semi-physical modeling approach. And the most well-known example of which is the Rothermel fire spread model, which really underpins many of the uh, operational or practical fire simulation tools. But there really is a wide spectrum of uh, modeling approaches that could fall into this uh, semi-physical or semi-empirical category. If we want to increase the description of the physics even further, then we might start to uh, really resolve in a lot of detail the gas phase. So we try to model in three dimensions the wind fields and the turbulence, uh, maybe the development of the fire plume and how that interacts with the wind fields. And so now we get into sort of the fire atmosphere interaction models where we have really a CFD approach to simulating uh, the atmosphere or the gas phase, but the fire spread model might still be fully empirical or semi-empirical. And so if we want to go a step further and improve the physical description of the solid phase and the fire spread as well, now we have really the detailed physics base to the fully physical CFD uh, fire models. In order to actually employ this detailed CFD approach, we need to, of course, handle our conservation equations. 
In the gas phase, we'll have a conservation of momentum equation. We'll see the effect of the vegetation or solid phase through a drag force term. We'll have a conservation of enthalpy equation, and we'll see the effect of the solid phase through convective and radiative exchanges and through the enthalpy of formation of any reactions occurring. And we'll have a continuity and conservation of species equations, and again, we'll see the effect of reactions that are occurring. Similarly, in the solid phase, we'll have a conservation of energy and mass equations, and we'll see the effect of these different interphase interactions appear again. But in order to actually close the model and have a, a working simulation, we need to expand these terms, and that requires us to actually be able to describe what the vegetation looks like and how it's behaving in different scenarios. One of the biggest challenges with wildland fires, and certainly in describing the vegetation, is capturing the vast range of scales involved. At the smallest structural scale, we could consider something like these pine needles, but of course, the pine needles come together to form clusters on a branch. The branches then form the tree crown, and multiple tree crowns would form a forest stand or a canopy. For a large-scale simulation, our control volume, or grid cell, might be as coarse as this 40-centimeter cube. If our control volume contains a mix of gas and solid phase, we won't be able to resolve the interphase interactions at the scale of individual elements like pine needles, so I'll have to use a bulk submodel representation of the vegetation. We now have a control volume with some unresolved or subgrid scale vegetation. We can start to describe this vegetation with some bulk parameters, such as the characteristic geometry of individual fuel elements, or the bulk density or packing ratio of vegetation within the volume. And using these parameters, we can then start to write some submodels to help close the conservation equations. For example, a simple drag force model. We can then take these types of control volumes with vegetation and assemble them to give an overall fuel structure, something like a forest stand. It appears then that it can be quite difficult to set up or parameterize a model like this, and there will certainly be a significant computational cost associated with resolving something like a forest stand. And there's also been some debate or discussion recently in the community as to whether these models perhaps in their application have gotten ahead of their current state of development, or if we shouldn't be placing so much faith in them. And there's been a few letters and uh, articles published to that effect. And I think these are interesting and worthwhile questions to ask, and certainly my own work has focused on trying to understand the current state of model development and where the limitations lie. But I also feel that there's no one particular modeling approach which is appropriate or applicable in all scenarios or for all objectives. So uh, why is it then that I'm focused so much on the detailed physics-based models, and why do I think it's worth all of my time and energy that I've put into this? Well, I think these models uh, really come into their own when we're interested in understanding and interrogating really some of the underlying physics and phenomena that drive a particular fire behavior. Take, for example, an open environment like this. We know wind should play a role in the fire behavior, and this can be due to the forward bursting of flames and hot gases, causing enhanced convective preheating. But we also observe that these dense heather fuels have the propensity to smolder and radiate a lot of energy and this is enhanced by the ambient wind as well. So there's different mechanisms that can play into both the fire spread and the fuel consumption. A physics-based model offers one tool that might allow us to explore the role of different mechanisms without presupposing the importance of one or another. In order to really investigate the modeling approach, I needed experimental data across the various scales of interest. And so some colleagues and I went to the Pine Barrens of New Jersey, where we were able to carry out a number of relatively large-scale field experiments, of which I focused on one in particular for this work. I don't want to spend too much time on the details of the experiments. There are a couple of papers out there you can check out if you're interested. But in general, uh, at the broad scale, we tried to characterize uh, aspects of the fire behavior, such as the spread, using uh, aerial IR imagery. We got uh, some nice three-dimensional models of the forest canopy structure using aerial LIDAR, and so we were able to look at the uh, potential effects of forest structure on the fire behavior and vice versa. And uh, then we characterized the surrounding environment uh, and the wind fields and turbulence and so on. But then, uh, in order to look in a bit more detail at some of the combustion processes, we focused on some particular sites and measured things like the local winds, the temperature profiles, uh, and heat fluxes. 
And then of course, uh, perhaps most interestingly, we captured a number of really nice videos, both in this experiment and in uh, many experiments that we've conducted over the years in the Pine Barrens. To give us a nice quantitative sense of some of the phenomena, we can see the flow patterns around the flame front, the flame height and flame angle. We can get a sense of the fuel consumption in different strata. And then we've tried to locate instrument packages in the same places where we have cameras so that we can supplement these visual observations with detailed measurements. In keeping with the themes of the different scales of interest and uh, the different scales that we need to understand in order to close or parameterize a model like this, I undertook two different studies. One was focused at a bit broader scale at really just trying to replicate the observed experimental behavior. And that's really the focus of the paper that's associated with this talk. So uh, if you want more detail, certainly go check that out. But uh, to give a brief summary, I looked really at the variability at kind of a plot or a forest stand scale that you might need to capture if you want to uh, apply the CFD model appropriately. And so in terms of the forest canopy, I looked at that three-dimensional LIDAR data and either took an approach of having a horizontally homogeneous forest canopy, so it's just a vertical profile of density. I segmented the forest canopy into uh, 10 by 10 horizontal grid so that you get a bit more of the uh, local spatial structure of the canopy. And then went a step further and redistributed the LIDAR data into these polygons that we were able to identify as being representative of tree crowns. And so looking at these different scales of uh, detail in the forest canopy, I tried to understand the impacts that that would have on the predictions of fire behavior. And what I really found was that because the density of the canopy overall is relatively low and is a smaller contributor to the overall energy release and therefore the feedback of energy to drive the fire spread. Uh, it's really the shrub layer and the pine needle litter layer that drive the fire spread in this particular environment. And so even though changing the distribution of the canopy density uh, changes the values of uh, bulk density that you have in particular grid cells and so on, there was no significant impact on the overall prediction of the fire spread. The other stand scale feature that I focused on was the turbulent wind profile, and particularly the boundary conditions. So I looked at the potential impact of either including turbulent boundary conditions with a synthetic eddy method, or just applying a static laminar wind profile at the boundary. And what I found was in the absence of a fire, there was some small effect in terms of the spatial uh, distribution of wind throughout the domain and creating a more uh, uniform spatial distribution with the synthetic turbulence because you're no longer relying on the canopy shear to provide that transition to turbulence from the laminar uh, boundary to the center of your domain. However, when the fire is simulated, the scale of the turbulence generated by the buoyancy of the plume in this particular case, with the relatively low winds we had compared to the intensity or the energy release of the fire, meant that really uh, that turbulent uh, generation dominated over the generation of turbulence from the canopy shear. And so the inclusion of turbulent boundary conditions did not have a significant impact on the fire behavior. So again, uh, along with the forest canopy, it starts to provide some understanding of the level of detail or the extent you need to go to uh, in order to collect the information to set up and run a model like this. Uh, certainly there will be configurations or scenarios where capturing uh, very fine detail in the distribution of canopy vegetation or uh, capturing the turbulent wind fields properly is going to make a big difference for your prediction, but we can start to understand uh, some of the cases where these features might not dominate the fire behavior. Alongside this larger scale evaluation of the model, I also undertook a somewhat reduced scale sensitivity study. And here I focused on parameters particularly related to the submodeling of the vegetation and those which have a potentially significant associated uncertainty. And I looked at the effect of changing these parameters on predictors of fire behavior such as spread rate, flame height, fire depth, fuel consumption, and so on. For example, I looked at the effect of changing the drag force model of the canopy and shrub fuels, uh, 
And you can see here how that modifies the average flame envelope as well as the average flow fields through that envelope. What we observe is that for lower canopy drag, we have higher surrounding flow around our flame region. And this flow can pass through the combustion zone and enhance convective preheating, leading to a faster spread rate. On the other hand, with higher canopy drag, we have restricted ambient flow around the flame front, so the buoyant flow of the plume ends up dominating. We have this large-scale recirculation, and that can lead to convective cooling ahead of the fire front and a slower spread rate. So the main result of my thesis was really to identify these different aspects of the model, both at the large scale and submodel scale, that require further attention and development and refinement if we really want to improve the overall approach and uh, expand the capability and reliability of these models. After completing my thesis, I knew we needed more and better experimental development data. And I really wanted to come in the lab, isolate some of the relevant physics, investigate them in detail, and then repackage this new understanding into the overall approach. So I put together this heated wind tunnel, the WEIRD, or Wildfire Exposure and Ignition Response Device. And first, using just uh, ambient temperature air, I looked at flow through different vegetation layers. I was able to characterize the permeability, as well as the flow within and above the layers. Then, using the heating element, I was able to expose similar vegetation structures to sudden pulses of high temperature air. And in this way, I could characterize the new salt number or the convective heating response. So through this approach, I'm able to start gradually ticking off some of the submodels and parameters I'd identified in my thesis. I've also continued to be involved in fieldwork in a number of different projects. And one example is some somewhat reduced scale field experiments with these 10 by 10 meter plots of pine needle litter in which we're investigating different aspects of fire spread. Here again, I'm coming from the perspective of the physics-based modeling and trying to make measurements and observations to inform model development. One example is the consumption of fuel and trying to understand how much fuel is consumed through flaming combustion versus smoldering combustion. So I'm looking at some overhead IR imagery and doing a uh, frequency analysis of the noise in the signal to try to understand when we have high frequency noise that might be associated with the turbulent flaming combustion or lower frequency noise associated with the smoldering region. So this analysis has yielded some nice maps that show a broad estimate of the distribution of flaming and smoldering combustion in our different 10 by 10 meter plots. And this is very useful for model development because we're trying to resolve these different combustion processes directly in the model. And if we don't have a good understanding of what's happening at the actual field scale, it's really hard to test and evaluate a model. Along with my continued involvement in field work, I've become quite interested in how we actually prepare and preserve data so that it can be used for future development efforts perhaps even by those who weren't involved in a particular experiment. We're really in an era where it's quite easy in a way to collect a lot of detailed, highly resolved information. If you take, for example, those 10 by 10 meter experiments, we have this fine resolution terrestrial LIDAR data that allows us to see the change in the surface fuel, but also the actual position of different sensors in experiments. So we have all of this uh, quite detailed information. It would be good to pass that on in a clear and understandable way. And one thing I've been working on is putting together uh, a sort of website where you can go and look at a particular experiment in three dimensions, observe some uh, features of the fire behavior, but also click on particular sensors and actually see the time resolved data that was being measured, and therefore hopefully get a better sense of what you're looking at than you might from just, say, a raw CSV file. And a big thanks to Jason Cole and Matt Patterson, who are doing a lot of work to archive this data as well as adapt this kind of visualization tool. Hopefully these kinds of efforts can help future experiments be leveraged to the full extent for model development. Well, thanks again for watching my video. Hopefully it's given you a bit of insight into my thesis and also how the findings have really informed uh, the development of my research career since then. And stay tuned for more.